There's a large class of problems that are linear in a certain sense. You start at the beginning and you go to the end. There are other problems that don't have this characteristic. So in the middle, you have to make choices. You might have to change your mind and so on and so forth. A prototypical example of the former is a race where you start at the beginning and you just run to the end. A prototypical example of the second is a maze where you may start, you may have to change your mind. Life is complex. You can also think of a list of children. Suppose I have, a I have 10 children, I have a list of them, and that's a linear structure. Instead, if I'm old or dead, I may have many generations of descendants, and those descendants may have an interesting structure. They're a tree of my descendants. We also might have a list of the lectures for this course. So I put them down and I say you should watch lecture one before you watch lecture 10. But some of you may want to skip around and a linear list doesn't really allow that because I haven't told you which ones you need to watch before which other ones. You just have to watch all of them. So I could have a more detailed analysis, which would be a directed acyclic graph of prerequisites. So you can see sort of pictures, intuitive pictures of what a tree looks like. What is a DAG? A DAG is an acyclic graph, so there's an order on it. And usually we can order prerequisites in a DAG so that you can find which thing you need to see before which other thing, um, and maybe skip the ones that aren't relevant for the particular thing you're interested in. So what's important really in these examples is whether or not you need to go back ever. So in linear examples, really all you need to know is where you are. Indeed, in a race, it's possible that you might have a choice. But the point is that you don't go back and need to explore a different choice, which is exactly what happens to this poor rat in the maze. If they don't find the cheese the first time around, they've got to go back to the intersection and remember at that point where they came from. This is a standard story from mythology. And if you look it up, you can see the nice story of Theseus and the Minotaur. And on the third occasion, he got some help from Ariadne. And this is in fact a pattern in logic where we eliminate the possible choices at each intersection, sort of one at a time. You can read the mythology. So in data structures too, you're going to look at structures that emphasize backtracking, like trees, directed acyclic graphs, and general graphs. In this course, we're going to avoid backtracking, but we're not going to look just at linear structures. We are going to look at those, and those include the kind of things you might expect, like a linked list or a array list. We will be looking at these kind of things. But we'll also be looking at a couple of structures that are tree-like. Um, this includes union find, or the disjoint set structure, and the heap structure. Um, this looks like a tree. It, both of these structures are actually stored in an arrays, and that's why we talk about them here. When you look at backtracking and problems with backtracking, in particular problems over trees and graphs, recursion really becomes helpful. And the reason is that you need to explore options. You need to go back in the past. You need to remember not just where you are now, but how you got here. And in order to do that, a stack is really handy. So a stack is a very simple structure. You store something, and as you put new things, you put them on top. And then when you take them back out, you take them back in the reverse order. And if you think about it, that corresponds to what we need to do in a maze. We go up until we hit a dead end. Then we need to go back to our last choice point and re-choose. And eventually, if that whole thing dead ends, we'll go back to the choice point before that. So the choices go on the stack and then come off them in the reverse order. This is exactly what function calls do in a programming language. They use something called the call stack. So whenever you call a function, it goes on the stack. You'll see this in Eclipse. So recursive functions are really handy for backtracking. 
And that's why they're so important in data structures too. We're gonna to talk about them here though. If you like almost as a warm up, it's good to start thinking about them because anything you can express with a loop, you can express recursively because recursive functions are properly more expressive than loops. Think about it this way. When you're in a loop, you're always going forward. You never have a chance to go backward to a previous iteration of the loop. But in a recursive function, you can do that. You, each iteration is sort of a separate recursive call. And so when you're done with one, you can go back to the one before it. Okay, what we're gonna show you here is how to translate any loop into a recursive function. And I'm gonna do it using a simple example to compute the number of fives in a list. Let's paste this code in Eclipse and see how it works. We'll start off with an example. Suppose I have the list 5, 11, 5, 5, and I want to know how many fives there are. Well, as usual, let's suppose we're about halfway through. So I've already looked at the first uh, two elements, and I'm about to look at the third. So that is I'm on index number two. So what do I need to know before I get to this point or before I do this computation? Well, I should know that there have, I've already seen one five so far. And when I see this five, well, the result will then become two. So at this point, um, when I'm about to look at the third element, I know that I've seen two. And therefore, when I see this five, I know there's three. Um, going backwards, you can see initially, I before I even look at the first element, I know that there's nothing. I, I, I've seen zero fives. After I've looked at the first element, I've seen one. So you can see this is the pattern of computation I sort of expect as I go through this um, array. Let me paste in a solution to this problem using a while loop. And instead of running the debugger interactively, I'm going to use the trace class to watch the steps of this program as it executes. So what I'm gonna do here is I have a little main method I pasted in here. Um, I'm going to rename the, the main for testing to main one, and I'm gonna rename this function to main. So when I run, it will run this code and run the debugger on my output. When num5 starts on line 12, neither I nor result have yet been defined. So as we progress through the execution of the code, um, first I is defined on, on line 12, and then result is defined on line 13. As we're waiting to execute line 17, this is the state of the machine. So we see that I, uh, I is indeed less than the length of the list. So we execute line 18 here. That will now tell us that list of i, that is the zeroth element of the list, is a five, and therefore will increment the result on line 19. And we continue around the loop like this until we get to four, at which point the function will return. So that's how we execute this as a while loop. And um, you can sort of see, you know, what we're doing here is, is making progress. Um, if you think about this slightly more abstractly, you can write down the list that we have not seen yet. So here I'm writing down the list we have not yet seen um, is 51155. After we get to position one, well, we're looking from this part on, this part on, this part on, etc. Um, the code that's executed here, you can just see it executing um, in the simulation on the, on the right-hand side. And, you know, this is a while loop. While loops always go forward, and what they need to do is change the state each time they go around the loop. So there's some set of variables that change every time around the loop. When we convert a while loop to a recursive function, what we do is we add one parameter for every variable that mutates during the function. So think about what we need to know in order to compute the number of fives. 
Well, each time around the loop, um, what are the variables we mention? We mention i, we mention list, and we mention result. So what I'll do is write a helper function that just mentions those three um, variables. So what I'm going to do here is create a helper function. I'm going to take the local variables of my loop and make them parameters of the function. So here I'm going to add parameters for i and result. I'm going to start things off by calling the helper function. Let's call it helper. I'm going to use the initial values for the variables, which were 0 and 0, as the initial values for the call to the helper function. And now, in the body of the helper function, what am I going to do? Well, my while loop, I can rephrase the while is going to become an if statement. And now, instead of incrementing my local variable here, what I'm going to do is to do a recursive call um, to num5's helper, where I'm incrementing the index by 1. Um, what I'm going to do is take uh, the result here from that recursive call and then return the result at the end. So this is how you can convert any while loop into a recursive function. Again, what did we do? We made the variables that appear in the while loop parameters of the helper function. We changed the while to an if. And where we incremented the looping variable, I changed that to be a recursive call. And note the form of the recursive call. I've added 1 to the parameter i here as we go. And um, I'm storing the result of that recursive call here so that I can return it later. What I have is a call to num5s on line 12. That's going to call num5's helper. So note the first call to num's5 helper has i equals 0. What do we do there? Well, we're going to look and we're going to see that the result needs to be incremented. So we'll increment the result. And now we'll do a recursive call on num5's helper with i plus 1. So we'll now do the recursive call here, passing in 1 and this. We keep going. We'll go to 2. When we see 2, we're also going to increment the result and then make a call to 3. And um, finally, we'll do a call to 4, and that's when we'll finish. Um, once we're done, we're going to return our values back. So we'll return 3. Um, that gets copied here. Then we return 3 here. That gets copied. So we're just going to copy the return value back as we go um, until we're done. So you can see that code here. And um, the computation is pretty much exactly the same as what we just did with the while loop. So if you think about the recursive calls, as I do the calls, I'm moving one further down the list. So the things that I have to look at become one fewer each time. And in, the, in addition, the result has now seen one more thing. So I've added one thing into the result. So my result initially 0, goes up to 1, then 2, then finally 3. If you think about the way the calls and returns happen, I'm doing these calls uh, progressively, and I'm just showing here the, the number of the on the picture. These correspond to the method um, calls. Note they're always going from 1 up. So method call number 3 here is um, initially going to have result 0. And these things go up until we get to the last call. 
And note that we're computing the result as we go, and we just return the result then as we finish. All right. Um, so this is simply a recursive form of a loop. We're doing all the computation forward just as we would in a loop. And this is something that is done all the time in compilers. Compilers can automatically convert between loops and this kind of recursive call and vice versa. This special kind of recursion here is called a tail recursion. Um, it's because the recursive call is the last thing the function does before it returns. So there's, there's nothing after the recursive call in the function uh, that's interesting. It just returns. And there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between loops and tail recursive functions. So this is sort of a mechanical sort of correlation.